So just a few words about me. As, as Aaron just said, I, am, uh, I got my PhD at the University of Napoli a few years ago, and I co-founded uh, Miteco, where I'm currently the chairman. And I'm mostly known in the WebRTC community as the, as the author of Janus. And those are some contacts if you want to, to get in touch or want to, to, find, to learn about some of the materials. So the first stop is, of course, talking, about, talking a bit about the WebRTC topologies. I, I, don't, I won't indulge too much in this because you're probably all well aware of this. So you know that WebRTC, especially when you want to do a multi-party kind of communication, has been great, especially since the beginning, because it has allowed us to do some kind of full mesh communication. So it, it's very easy with WebRTC to, with, with a serverless infrastructure, so it's just something to take care of the signaling, it's very easy to have multiple people interact with each other and exchange media in real time. The problem is, of course, that as soon as you want to do something more complex or take advantage of some some, as soon as you want to take advantage of some more functionality or let's say improve uh, improve the way that you handle the, your CPU, the bandwidth, and so on, this is not really feasible, especially when you want to, to go beyond a certain number. And so you have a couple of choices here. So one is to go the MCU road. So you have a multipoint control unit that basically mixes everything together. You send a single stream to the, oh, your sender is, you send a few stream to the server, you send a, a single stream back that basically is a composition of everybody involved. Or much more common in WebRTC deployments lately, you choose an SFU instead, so a so-called selective forwarding unit. And how this works is that you never do any mixing in there. You basically publish something towards a media server. This becomes something that other people can, can, um, can subscribe to, basically. So it's much better than the full mesh, because in full mesh, if there are four people in the room, you have to encode and send three times the same thing. With an SFU, you just send it once, and then everybody can just pick it from there. So it's, you save on CPU, you save on bandwidth, especially on the, on the client side, and you basically move a bit, a bit of the complexity of how to route packets back and forth to, to a server instead. But of course, an SFU is mostly useful when it has some additional tools at its disposal, because this way it's already very powerful, because it means that whatever I send, people can choose whether or not they want to receive it, maybe they want to receive uh, they want to reuse the same peer connection to, to receive multiple people. You can switch from one to another, and this is what most SFUs allow. But if you want to really take advantage of some uh, additional functionality, so for instance, reacting more promptly to bandwidth issues, or let's say, take care of your application uh, more importantly, because for instance, there are times where you only need a thumbnail of a guy, and another time when you, when you need a full, a full screen versions of them instead, having something that, that makes this possible without having to actually renegotiate too much would actually be really useful, which is where Simulcast and SVC come into play. So Simulcast in particular, in a nutshell, is the conceptually quite simple. So as a publisher in a, in a conference room or, in a, or somewhere, you basically send multiple qualities of yourself. So in this case, this is exemplified by these three different arrows of three different colors you can see that big green arrow has the high quality version of yourself. Think of a 7020p uh, stream that, that is capturing your webcam, for instance. At the same time, the same exact stream is also encoded in 360p, for instance, the red arrow, and 180p. So you're basically, at the same time, sending multiple qualities of yourself to the SFU, which means that the SFU has now much more flexibility in terms of what to send other people. So, in this case, we have two people interested in receiving the high quality stream and the person that is instead receiving the lowest quality stream. And that might, that might happen because of different application logics. So it may be because the user down there doesn't have enough bandwidth for any of the other two streams, or maybe because in its own application logic, that user doesn't need anything more than the low quality version of their guy. Because for instance, it's a Jitsi kind of application. You have a big screen and several thumbnails. In that specific moment, you only need the thumbnail for that guy, so there's no point in for, this, for the SFU to send you anything more than that. It would be wasted data, basically. And so, as you can imagine, this is a quite effective tool for that, that SFUs can actually take advantage of. On the other end, SVC tried to solve the same problem, but in a very peculiarly different way, because basically you don't have any more three different streams that you send at the same time. Or, or to be more precise, you do, but there are actually three different layers of the same single stream. So you can see that those three nested arrows as some kind of an onion, where you have different layers, actually one wrapped around the other. And so the SFUs has just the capability of stripping one layer 
uh, or stripping another and so on to actually send less data to the, to, the, to the users and still give them something meaningful that they can decode. And in this case, we have the three different users there that are actually subscribed to the same stream but interested, again, for different reasons, maybe because they need to or maybe because they want to, each receiving one the, the highest quality stream, one the medium quality stream, and, one, and the other just the lowest quality stream instead. And pretty much, as you can see, the same kind of effect that you get in simulcast, but implemented in a very, very different way, that in conceptually a very different way. So if we wanted to summarize the differences, we might say that, especially from a, from a signaling perspective, with simulcast, you basically have the same source. So again, let's imagine we are just capturing your webcam here. We use the same M line to signal this, this stream, but then we basically have the different quality tracks that we mentioned as actually separate tracks. And each of those tracks, when we map them then to an RTP stream, is actually mapped to a different SSRC, which means that from a network perspective, from a media perspective, these are actually three separate streams that can also be decoded completely independently from each other. So uh, no matter, when, which, uh, no matter uh, how we are routing the streams over there, we don't really need any of those other streams in order to be, to be able to decode the blue or the green or the red stream. Uh, everything is actually self-contained in those streams. Whenever we switch from one to the other, all we need is actually in the stream that we are going to switch to. This is not true for SBC instead because, again, we are using the same source. We are, again, using the same M line because it's the same stream. But as we were saying before, the, the different qualities are now, and I'm, again, I'm, now I'm putting qualities in quotes there because they're actually quality can mean several different things. In this case, most of the times it means different resolutions. So let's say a high resolution, mid resolution, low resolution, but it might also mean a same resolution stream encoded at very different bit rates instead. That has also the same meaning, but the concept is pretty much the same. A key difference with respect to simulcast is with SVC, all tracks share the same SS SSRC, mostly because they actually are the same stream. They were actually just stripping layers from an existing stream instead, which also means, though, that each of the tracks actually depends on, on one or more of the, uh, the streams that preceded. So the, those layers, we cannot just strip them and and remove them as, uh, as we want. And SFU needs to be aware of these dependencies whenever a switch needs to occur, because maybe we want to switch to a higher quality layer, but before we can do that, we first need the decoder to decode something from the middle layer instead, which uh, compared to the simulcast is, let's say, a bit more effective because you typically use less bandwidth because you are actually encoded different layers rather than completely different tracks that are completely independent with each other but it's also more CPU intensive for the encoder because it's, uh, it's a bit more complicated. A fun fact though is that uh, something that we actually give for granted but it's not really part of Simulcast itself is that uh, when you enable Simulcast in browsers right now, for instance in Chrome or in Firefox, you get out of the box temporal scalability which is not part of, of Simulcast itself. As temporal scalability can actually be seen as a feature of SVCs instead because in that case you're actually dropping some packets of that existing stream to basically still get things something that you can decode but at a, a lower bit rate and a lower frame rate instead. So these are concepts that don't need to be confused with each other even though in WebRTC right now uh, one is actually uh, um, shipped with the other. An important point that uh, both Bernard and, and Dr. Alex made before is that both only make sense with an SFU on the pad though and it, it was clear by just looking at the image that we've seen before. So. First of all, because browsers can negotiate, cannot negotiate simulcast itself unless, as we've seen before, you, you play a bit with the playground that Philip Panke wrote. And, but most importantly, because it wouldn't make, make much sense. So the, the main point about sending multiple qualities of yourself is that you want the selective forwarding unit to be smart about what to send uh, to any other person at any specific time, which doesn't, so it doesn't make much sense to send all, of the, all the qualities of the same stream to a recipient, so you, you just need one, really. And m almost all of, pretty much all SFUs support simulcast today, and some also support SBC. So com coming to a bit more in detail about the simulcast stuff, we've already seen this slide before by Dr. Alex. So Dr. Alex is uh, the, the main responsible for the, for the ITF hackathon. And a couple of uh, editions ago, I think it was in Prague, we, we met to actually work a lot specifically on simulcast, because it was about the time, and I'll, I'll get into this in a few minutes, 
It was at the time where actually Simulcast was causing a bit of issues to, to some SFU developers, and so it made sense to have an ITF hackathon. It made sense to participate in the ITF hackathon and try to do something about that. And more specifically, there were a lot of browser developers, some SFU developers that was among them as well, and we got a lot of things done very quickly. It was, it was very, very useful, and one of the outcomes was this slide that, that Dr. Alex shared before. So before we'd understand the Simulcast a bit better, it's also uh, maybe it's a bit better also to, to dig a bit into the difference, uh, different approaches by which you can get simulcast done today. And historically, the, the first approach you could do was basically SDP managing, which basically means you have an, S, you have SD, an SDP generated by the browser, you manipulate somehow manually in order to get simulcast working. And I mean historically, because this was basically what you would do with, uh, with Chrome and Plan B which was basically a hack to try and do exactly what Google Hangouts was doing at the time. So Hangouts was enabling simulcast uh, on their own. There were no specific APIs to do that, and so basically somebody reverse engineered the approach they, they did and starting doing the same thing. And the way it works is fairly simple. So basically in this case we can see that this is a video I'm line. We have a couple of SSRCs. One is the SSRC of the, of the track itself, the video that we are sending. The other one is related to the retransmission SSRC instead, which is why they are grouped in the same SSRC group over there. So what you want to do when you want to enable simulcast this way is you basically add a couple of other couples as well. So we have a, a, another couple here, again, two SSRCs, one for the stream, another for the, for the retransmission. You do the same with another, and then you tie them together with the SIM SSRC group. So we basically manipulate the SDP manually, add a couple of, of those things over there. We add that additional SSRCs. As soon as we pass these to the browser, magically something happens and, the, and Chrome starts enabling simulcast for you. So, and I mentioned that it's the ugly way because, of course, it does work, but it's not really effective. First of all, because there's, there is, is no real API to do the job. You have no control over what to send, how to send it, and so on. It's actually everything is encoded hard-coded in a table that they have deep in the code. So in this case, for instance, you can see the, the maps that Google Chrome had to decide, for instance, when to switch from one resolution to another, depending on the bandwidth, the frame rates, and, and so on and so forth. So if you are okay with these limitations, it was kind of cool, but it was definitely not the best way to do that, which is why eventually some APIs emerged in order to do this thing properly. But I mean, no matter what this kind of works, if you have a look, for instance, at, the, at the, one of the Janus demos, in this case, the echo test, you can play with it and see, for instance, that uh, whatever you send, you can then subscribe to one of the available streams out there, and it kind of works, so it's nice enough. But again, this was um, not the proper way to do that, and Firefox was the first one to actually start using the, the RID attribute, which stands for RTP Stream ID, to actually do this properly. And the way... Uh, I'm mentioning Firefox here because Firefox were the first one to adopt this, uh, this kind of approach, but they are also now a bit behind in terms of the spec because the way that you are doing it right now is not really in line with how the spec defines uh, simulcast needs to be negotiated. But it's, it was actually close enough at the time. And more specifically, we can see that they are basically using the parameters part of, of, a, of a video track in order to specify exactly what they want in terms of simulcast of simulcast streams and how they should look like. So as a very simple example, in this case, we are enabling three different streams labeled H, M, and L in terms of our ID that we are using. And we are, for instance, stating that for the H1, we want a maximum bit rate, for example, of 900, uh, 900 kilobits per second. For the M layer, which is the middle quality, we are okay with the maximum bit rate of 300, but also we want the resolution to be half of the original stream. And for the lowest one, we want the resolution to be a fourth of that, so pretty much a thumbnail, and we're okay with a much lower bitrate instead. So what this results is, and this again is an API, so we are not really messing with the SDP manually here. We end up with an SDP that looks pretty much like this. So we end up with, of course, the, the read uh, extension attribute being negotiated, because in this case, the different streams in simulcast are being uh, explicitly labeled via, via an RTP extension now. We have also some explicit mention of uh, exactly which layers we have, and as you see, as Firefox is also signaling some SSRCs over there, which uh, I'll, I'll go back to in a minute because this is an important aspect to consider. And as a recipient of simulcast, uh, this way, the only thing that you have to do is signal that you're, of course, uh, able to recognize that extension over there, 
and signal the fact that you're okay with receiving any of those layers over there, and then it's up to the recipient part to, to treat them accordingly. And the end effect is, unsurprisingly, pretty much identical to the one in Chrome, because really nothing changes in terms of uh, the functionality itself. You're still able to send multiple qualities and choose which one to receive. What changes is actually how this happens on the wire, so specifically send, signaling those RID attributes in the way. But as I was saying, Firefox says uh, it's not doing it this spec way because as Bernard said in this presentation earlier today, the proper way to do that is when, actu when you actually add the new transceiver and you configure the sim simulcast envelope itself. So, and this exemplifies why uh, Bernard was also saying that the moment that you create five layers, those are the five layers that you are stuck with for the whole call. So you can modify them, you can enable them or disable them, but you're stuck with that simulcast envelope for the whole call. And pretty much the syntax is very much the same as we've seen for Firefox. The difference is where we are actually generating this. Uh, but another key difference is in terms of how the SDP looks like, which is pretty much like this. So in this case, Chrome is also signaling a repaired uh, RIDs uh, extension because it needs to differentiate between uh, the stream itself and the retransmission channel for the same stream. But as you can see, there are no SSRCs instead, and there's also a small difference in how the simulcast line is handled. So for instance, there is no read equals kind of thing because that's not part of the spec anyway. But the key part is that there are no SSRCs anyway, which actually, let's say, caused a bit of a frenzy in some WebRTC developers because SSRCs is what most, uh, including us at the time, uh, WebRTC servers used to demultiplex traffic. So considering that everything goes on the same port, you need to have something to discriminate incoming traffic. So you, to know this is the first, this is a packet for the first audio M line, this is a packet for the third video M line, and so, forth, so on and so forth. And SSRC is a very easy way to decouple that. So you just have a look at the packet, you find the SSRC, it was negotiated in the SDP, you know to what, to what it ties. So the moment that SSRCs disappear from the M lines, this, this can become a big problem. The rationale from the Chrome's perspective, and this was also discussed in a W3C call uh, last spring, was that basically Chrome uh, explained that they had a, an issue of how to map actually the RID attribute to the SSRC attributes in the SDP, so which one maps to the other. And some basically assumed that the ordering itself was enough, which was actually not really the case. So for instance, in Firefox, it was not really always the case in that sense. So there have been some attempts, especially by Harald Alvestran, to basically try and write a draft to provide some guidance to browser developers to try and basically discipline a bit this kind of relationship between RID and SSRC, even if it just means the order that you see them is actually the order that, that they have to, to map as well. But the reality is that the only real solution if you want to be, let's say, forward thinking in this sense is to, you should rely on the RID attribute instead to do that. Because really there's nothing else that you need in order to implement that association over there. Because, and uh, it's probably easier if you look at this simple Wireshark trace over here. Anytime that we receive an RTP packet related to a, to a simulcast stream, we'll also get uh, an RTP extension that includes the RID value that we're interested about. So we've, we've seen before that in this case, this session was saying that the RID attribute was identifier number five, which means it's this, uh, if I can find my mouse, is this identifier over here. We see that the, this RID is related to, to the M, to the M RID, which was the middle layer in our, in our case. We just have to check which SSRC was associated to this specific packet, and now we know explicitly which kind of mapping have exists between RID and SSRC. So now, anytime that we see that SSRC again, we know exactly which RID it, it relates to, which makes, which makes it quite simple to, to decouple things, basically. And of course, our adding RIDs, extensions, and so on and so forth makes packets a bit larger, so it can be a bit of a problem, which is why Chrome has actually stated their intent not to send those RID attributes forever. Basically, as soon as, for instance, as an SFU, you acknowledge that you received and you're, you're aware of that SSRC in an RTCP packet that basically explains that uh, you are receiving that stream and you're handling it correctly, then the browser will be aware of the fact that you do know the relationship of those between those values and will stop sending you the RID from that point on forward. But at the very beginning, the RID is something that you do need to, to be able to, to decouple. And again, this is just pretty much the same screenshot as before because again, nothing changes in terms of what happens 
from a user perspective, but the difference is, uh, is as a WebRTC developer, you have much more control about what you want to do and how you want to do it, especially in terms of how you want to configure the different layers, how many layers you want, how they should behave, and so on. Which brings us to, to SVC, because as, we, as, we, as we've seen, SVC is quite different in terms of how it actually goes over the wire with simulcast. So definitely no RID involved here, because it's always the same stream. The, the one thing to, to clarify is that SVC is actually only partly implemented in WebRTC right now. Most specifically, it's only implemented for VP9 and only hidden behind a specific custom flag. So you have to launch Chrome with a specific flag in order to enable it for testing purposes, which means it's not really av available to the wide public or as I say, um, easily as a service for people because it would require your clients to, to launch Chrome manually, by the way. But this is something that we enabled uh, quite, quite soon, and we did this in cooperation with, uh, with Dr. Alex and with Cosmos. So together we worked on integrating this VP9 SVC support in Janus itself, which eventually led to an interface that is pretty much similar to the ones that we've seen before. So again, we have ways to, to choose which, which layer we want to receive, maybe some temporal layers and so on. The difference is that what is feeding those things that we can actually control is not different streams, it's actually different layers but the end result is pretty much the same. But uh, an important aspect to take into account is, of course, the different way that SVC is conceived with respect to simulcast, and most importantly, all the dependencies that exist between the different layers that I was mentioning. So the fact that you may not be able to decode one stream unless you decode it's part of another stream as well. And this is actually all formalized in, um, in the AV1 specification. And actually, uh, Dr. Alex, will, I'm glad Dr. Alex is here and he will talk about AV1 later because this means that I will not have to go too much into the details about that ugly picture over there. Because this, this is basically an example of how these kind of layer dependencies work. And in the, uh, in the WebRTC SVC specification right now, it's been decided that all of these diagrams that you see over there, and there are many of them, and uh, I'll explain why in a, in a second, are actually going only to be in the AV1 specification because AV1 actually mandates SVC, and so it's actually a very good reference point for discussing SVC in the first place. But actually, the, the let's say, the scalability modes that you can actually use are actually going to be defined in, uh, in the specification itself. And as you can see, there are many of those, so really a lot, 28. And, you may, want, you may ask why there are so many and why they are there in the first place. And the main reason is that, uh, the main reason is that uh, defining those dependencies is, of course, possible, but it would be a nightmare for a WebRTC developer. So you really don't want the WebRTC developer to configure these dependencies by himself and try to describe them in a programmatic way in WebRTC. The easiest way is to define some predefined scalability modes instead that have some very specific dependencies in place and have also some very specific relationships in terms of how the different layers should be. So for instance, you might have um, pictures that are one, the alpha, the other will going down, whether or not you want interlayer dependencies or something that is much closer to simulcast rather than SVC and, th sorry, and things like this. And basically define them programmatically so that from, an, from a web developer perspective, all you need to do when you create a new stream and you want to use SVC is say, for instance, I want to use L3T3, which means I want three layers, three spatial layers with the dependency between each other, so something that is SVC, and I also want three temporal layers at the same time. And of course, you also want to be able to possibly configure them in a similar way as we've seen before for simulcast, so deciding, for instance, some more relationships in terms of how much bitrate to allocate for one or the other. And this was actually partly the subject of another hackathon, the, the one that was in Montreal last November. And basically, Harald Alvestrand, I mentioned that uh, Chrome has some uh, VP9 code in place already, but it's hidden behind the flag. So what he did was basically hook uh, part of those uh, the implementations to something that you could use from JavaScript instead. And so expose some of those scalability modes that I listed here, just a couple for, as a proof of concept, and check whether or not this would actually result in those values being used for a peer connection. And it actually did, so I, I, I helped him very briefly by just proof testing this with, with, Chrome, with Janus, since we do support VP9 SVC, and it kind of worked, which actually led to the uh, Chrome intent to ship actually this, so that sooner or later this will actually end up in, in browsers for, for everybody to use. And I'm very close to the end of my presentation. I'll just really briefly mention that 
Uh, SBC was also a, a very important key discussion in Fukuoka. The W3C met in Fukuoka uh, in September to discuss all of this. I, I, I wasn't able to attend, but I followed remotely and I followed the minutes to, to see a bit what, what was happening. And of course, a lot of interesting things were discussed there. The thing that interested me the most, though, was what it may look like in the future in terms of a, uh, let's say, API perspective. Because again, we want to be able to have some sort of control as we have for Simulcast, also for SVC, even though we are doing things differently. And one thing to clarify, though, is that the active part may actually be more tricky in SVC, because as we said, if for to decode, la to decode the highest layer, I need to have some packets of the second layer as well. If I disable the second layer, I may end up with the highest layer not being able to be decoded in at all. So there are some, uh, let's say, things that need to be taken into account there, but this is just an example. This is not in any spec. It's some, something that was discussed in, uh, in the meeting, but it's something that looks like something that could be actually useful. So what's next? I mean, again, uh, you probably realize that I'm really fond of this IETF hackathon right now, and we are going to actually meet again in Singapore next month. So, and since SVC is actually a quite hot topic, I expect that this might be another thing, another nice venue to actually try and proactively work on, on some more aspects to, to get it done quickly, rather, um, sooner rather than later, especially because the motto at the ITF is that rough consensus running code and running code is, of course, very important. So if we have something that works for SVC, it would be very interesting. For Just for a time, I didn't mention something else that might be interesting. So for instance, the fact that stats should actually reflect simulcast and SVC, it's, because it's been an issue for a while. You know how many bytes you're sending. You don't know how many bytes you're sending for the different layers. But it's actually, and uh, Alex, please correct me if I'm wrong, I think they are now, they are part of the spec. So they are not implemented yet, but the spec, the spec clarifies that the browser should expose this information for, for all things. And I hope I didn't run too long, so uh, I'm pretty much done. I, I hope we have time for a few questions now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lorenzo.